So we've already talked about uh, the the creep compliance. Now we want to talk a little bit about the the relaxation modulus, or in in uh, in the case of the Kelvin Voigt model, just simply the the potential for stress relaxation. So let's begin just like we had before, and we'll start with the Maxwell model, and then we'll talk a little bit about the a little bit about the Kelvin Voigt model. So so here we go. Uh, let me remind you what the Maxwell model was, the Maxwell material. So here's a Maxwell material. And it was a spring and a dash pot in series. Something like that. Where we called this, we characterized the spring with a, a stiffness E. And we said that the dash pot had some viscosity eta. And the governing equation in this case was eta epsilon dot is going to be equal to uh, eta over e times sigma dot plus sigma. Okay, so let's call that equation one. We've already derived that before. And so what are we looking at when we're talking about a relaxation modulus? Well, remember uh, several lectures ago, we talked about the definition of that. We want to instantaneously apply some fixed strain. We'll call it epsilon naught. We want to hold at that strain level uh, to get the relaxation modulus, which means that we're expecting the stress to decrease with time. Okay, so uh, we want to instantly uh, apply um, a strain, call it epsilon naught, okay, and then hold uh, to get the relaxation, okay. So the stress is going to vary with time, presumably, and so we would we define that before as the relaxation modulus, which is a function of time, is going to be equal to sigma as a function of t, that stress is a function of time, divided by that strain epsilon naught that we're holding it at. Let's call that equation two. Okay. Um, so in this case, let's let's think about what equation one becomes. Okay. Uh, well, since forever and for always in this in this uh, test, epsilon is equal to epsilon naught, it's fixed as a constant, right? For all uh, t greater than uh, uh, or equal to zero, then there's no actual strain rate term for the entire uh, system. So this left-hand side goes to zero. Right, so in this case, what that means is that epsilon dot is equal to zero. Uh, so we can write equation one as um, a homogeneous equation, eta over e times sigma dot plus sigma uh, equals zero. Okay, so let's call that equation three. Okay, now uh, we can solve this uh, just like we'd solved uh, Kind of similar problems. We're going to solve this by a separation of variables. Uh, so let's say solve equation three uh, by a separating variables. Okay, separating variables. Okay, so when we, how do we do that? Well, let's let's just go ahead and rearrange equation three and write uh, sigma dot as d sigma dt. And I'm going to, on the other side, have a negative e over eta times sigma, right? I can, then, uh, I can then divide everything by sigma and then multiply by dt. And I'm left with d sigma over sigma is equal to negative e over eta dt, right? One other thing to note. We had in the previous lecture when we talked about compliance, uh, the creep compliance, we had defined this term uh, that is uh, e over eta, and we said it's it's one over some characteristic time. Uh, uh, so that's our characteristic. We'll call it in this case the relaxation time. So characteristic uh, relaxation time. And we just denote it with the variable tau. Okay, so I want to go ahead and integrate both sides. Okay, so I'll say integrating gives 
the following. Right, we're going to have a positive stress that if, for this particular test, so I don't have to give you an absolute value. This becomes natural log of sigma. It's going to be equal to negative 1 over uh, tau times t, or I could just write negative t over tau, uh, then plus some constant of integration, call it c1. I can uh, treat both of those sides as the exponent and, and uh, raise to the uh, e raised to that power, and then this becomes sigma as a function of t is going to be equal to c1 times e to the negative t over tau. Of course, the c1 here isn't the same as the c1 there, but we haven't solved for it yet, so it, we, can, we can just leave it as, as that. Let's call that equation 4. So what do we need to do? Now we just need to uh, apply the initial condition. Okay? So let's go ahead and apply the initial condition. And what is the initial condition? Well, uh, the initial condition is going to be, let's go back, let's go back up to the top and think about it here. If I instantaneously increase the strain, we already talked about this in the previous lecture, but the dash pot isn't going to respond. So all of the strain, if I instantaneously strain this, is going to be dumped into the spring, okay? So if I go back down now to uh, here, what I can say is that uh, my initial st stress, sigma naught, is going to be all of the strain uh, dumped into the spring, so just E times epsilon naught, okay? So I apply this to equation 4. At time t equals 0, this quantity goes to 1. We're just left with C1 on this side, and we can see that C1 is going to be equal to E times epsilon naught, right? So then we can write the stress relaxation now um, as follows. Uh, that's relaxation is then uh, sigma as a function of time is going to be equal to C1, which we just said was E times epsilon naught. Now E to the negative T over tau. Let's call that equation 5. Okay, from equation 5, we can compute the relaxation modulus, right? So uh, let's go ahead and compute uh, the relaxation modulus, ER, uh, from equation 5. And if we do that, we have that ER, which will be a function of T, is going to be equal to, as we said before, sigma T uh, divided by epsilon naught, I divide epsilon by epsilon naught from in equation 5, and I'm just left with e times uh, e to the negative t over tau. Okay? Let's call that equation 6. So how about what happens if I plot equation 5? What does that look like? So here we go. A plotting equation 5. I end up with, let me give you a, there's my stress axis. And here's my time axis. Okay, so t and sigma. And immediately, I have this quantity that is e times epsilon naught. And it exponentially decays, asymptotically approaching zero, right? And finally, at time t equals infinity. Okay? So, there you have exponential decay of the stress. Okay, so that's the Maxwell model. What about the Kelvin Voigt uh, material? So let's think about that next. So here we go, the Kelvin Voigt material. And let me um, draw a picture for you uh, just so that we're reminded of it. It was a spring and a dash pot in parallel, if you remember. So there's my spring. There's my dash pot. Okay. And so we define that as E and that as eta. And we had a governing equation in this case that looked like sigma is equal to uh, E times epsilon plus eta times epsilon dot. Okay. And let's call that equation seven. Okay. So let's think about this. Let's, let's go ahead and apply an instantaneous strain to this. Well, there's a problem. 
We already have talked about, we can't apply an instant instantaneous strain to the dash bot because it would give us an instantaneous stress. So let's note that here. Here's a problem. Okay, we can't uh, apply um, an instantaneous strain, right? Why? Because that would require uh, an infinite strain rate, require epsilon dot uh, to go to infinity, which is going to imply that the stress is going to have to go to infinity, which is not possible. Therefore, the, the Kelvin Voigt, I'm going to abbreviate it as KV, uh, that material, okay, uh, doesn't have a relaxation modulus. And, it, and, and we've kind of exposed a pathology uh, with this uh, particular simplified model. So modulus. Okay. So um, we actually can't solve for a relaxation modulus, modulus for this material. So what I want to do is basically conclude uh, with some remarks about each of these materials and why neither one of them uh, really give us the viscoelastic behavior that we're looking for and then suggest sort of the simplest uh, modification to each one that would give us um, at least the, the general behaviors that we would expect to see for a viscoelastic material. Okay, let me, let me conclude here by giving you some, a, final, a couple, couple final remarks. Okay. I guess the main point is that neither uh, the Maxwell uh, uh, nor the uh, the Kelvin Voigt material um, represent the behavior of a viscoelastic material. Let me say represent the real behavior, right, of a viscoelastic material. All right. However, they each they each have some uh, some qu uh, component that does behave that does um, uh, occur in a viscoelastic material, right? So, um, but both have some components. Okay. So, specifically, what are the problems? Well, let's think about the Kelvin Voigt since we just talked about this, right? So, the Kelvin Voigt model uh, has has a couple problems. One is that it has uh, no uh, time independent strain. Right? There's no uh, no way to uh, have a just a purely elastic response independent of time. So that's that's a problem. The other that we just done, and we, we already talked about that uh, actually in the previous lecture on creep compliance, we showed that if we applied an instantaneous stress, um, strain would require some time to accumulate. There was no, no time independent strain. And what we just discovered here in, in, in this lecture was that there's no, um, there's no uh, 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 stress relaxation at constant strain, right? Right. If and and we can we didn't actually prove that we just said we couldn't do a relaxation test. But you can you can do a thought experiment. If you even it, whatever strain you had, uh, if you stop that strain in time, there is no uh, and, and hold that the stress doesn't relax. Um, if you hold that, the stress will will drop to whatever value the strain is in the spring and remain there for all time. So there's no stress relaxation at constant strain, and there's no time independent uh, strain. And both of those are something that we would expect to see in a real viscoelastic material. Now, how about the Maxwell model? Okay, in the Maxwell material, the main problem here is that there's no time dependent strain recovery, right? Which we also know uh, is, is uh, a real uh, feature of a viscoelastic material. So, no time dependent strain recovery, right? All uh, all the strain recovery was time independent. So if you if you applied uh, a stress and you generated some level of strain and you let off the stress, you got an instantaneous um, release of that stress because the spring would go down, but the dash pot uh, never recovers. Okay, so those are the features that are problematic.
So what I want to ask now is how could we remedy uh, sort of these deficiencies in either of these models? So that's that's the, the kind of final question I want to deal with here. So uh, how can we remedy uh, these deficiencies? So let's think about that. Okay. Well, let's think about the Maxwell case first because that's how we, what we've been talking about, right? So let's go ahead and draw our, our Maxwell model. We have a spring and a dash pot in series. And we know that we want there to be uh, some, some form of time dependent strain recovery, which is actually gonna require a spring in parallel, okay? Something like that. And so this still has the value of eta, but now we have two springs, let's call this E2, and this spring here, E1, okay? How about for the Kelvin Voigt model? Well, in this case, we want there to be a time independent strain. So if you're, let's, let's first draw our model. We had a spring in parallel with a dash pot. Okay, and what we need for that time independent component is just a spring. Okay, and so kind of similarly, we could have that still be eta, we would have this be E2, and then this single spring be E1. Okay, it turns out that these have specific, uh, specific title, they're referred to as the standard linear solids. Okay, so they're standard linear solids. Sometimes we'll abbreviate it SLS. Okay. And what, what are they? Well, the, the standard linear solids, they represent the, the uh, simplest uh, models that can, that can predict the type of viscoelastic behavior that we observe. So they represent the simplest um, models uh, that can give a realistic viscoelastic results. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm not going to develop the governing equations uh, for these materials. Um, and the reason is because we're going to try to develop a more general, general approach so that we can develop much more complex models um, and still solve those. So rather than kind of give you an intermediate, uh, more complicated differential equation, I'm going to give you eventually a really complicated differential equation that uh, will serve as a framework uh, and develop a solution technique that we can use to solve any arbitrary um, sort of uh, set of these, these class of uh, material models. Okay, so what specifically were we looking for? Uh, we wanted uh, stress relaxation under constant strain. Right, and we wanted that, of course, to be uh, time dependent. Okay, uh, so stress relaxation under constant strain. So that's one of the features that we want to make sure it has, and we need uh, uh, time dependent strain recovery. Okay, so if we uh, if we unload, pull the, pull the stress off, we want some of that strain to recover in a time-dependent fashion. So time-dependent strain recovery uh, after removing the load. Both of those will give us that. Okay? So that's, that, that basically concludes this section on uh, simple viscoelastic models. We're going to uh, uh, now move to talk about some more complex models as well as some uh, more sophisticated solution techniques.